Um, all right. Well, welcome. Good evening. Uh, I'm George Hall, and this is Lecture 11 of the Fiscal History of the United States. Um, this evening, I want to discuss the funding of infrastructure. Uh, it's a timely topic. Uh, from the end of the War of 1812 and well into the 1830s, there was a burst of investment in public works projects. Um, they were called internal improvements. Uh, now, these projects were important in an economic sense in that they opened up the transportation routes to move goods and people between the eastern seaboard and the middle of the United States. They were also important politically in that they helped to bind the nation together. So the United States would still break apart in the 1860s in the, in the middle, in a very terrible civil war. But these improvements helped to create a single nation that would eventually encompass a, you know, the, a big chunk of uh, the North American continent out of a collection of much smaller individual states. Um, however, the funding of these projects also led to a single fiscal, a second, I'm sorry, also led to a second uh, fiscal crisis in the, in the early 19, in the early 1840s, 1840s. This time the crisis would be at the state level rather than the federal level. And as Tom has emphasized in this course, the resolution of fiscal crises often lead to a rewriting of the rules. And as we'll see, this is also going to hold in this case. So, um, all righty. So let's get going. Let's see here. Um, all righty. So we want to think about some big questions here in this, in this first part of the lecture. So one is, how should the government allocate public lands? One of the huge advantages that the United States has or had sort of over every other nation, and it actually what makes, it, what makes sort of the history of the United States so exciting in some sense or so remarkable, is that they get to, uh, get to create a society with almost a clean slate. Now, now of course, the Native Americans do, or don't feel that way. They've got a society going, and their society is going to get replaced. But the United States is blessed. The United States is blessed with a huge uh, block of, of public lands, and we've got to decide how we're going to allocate those lands, how we're going to use them, what's going to become public lands, what's going to become private lands, and how those lands are going to be distributed. Another question is sort of how much national planning should a government do? We often think about national planning as something that's very European. We don't think of it as very American to think about national planning, but American national planning actually goes back uh, very much to the early part of the country, the early part of the nation. And if you think about, you look at the way the U.S. is laid out, you realize that it's part of a national plan. There was national planning that goes on. Third question is sort of what's the government's role in funding public works and infrastructure projects? Back then it was called internal improvements. Um, and when we think about public works and infrastructure, we think about things like the interstate highway system. Uh, right now there's a, uh, quite a bit of discussion going on about uh, infrastructure projects and particularly the maintaining of existing roads and airports. And the question will be about how we fund those today, whether we fund them purely out of tax dollars, out of the gas tax, or are they going to be a private-public partnership? Uh, those same questions are going, to, are going to be with the United States uh, in this earlier period. And then the fourth question is sort of, which is sort of underlying all of these, is whether the Union is a mere confederation of states or really, really is a national government. That is, are we bound together by a treaty or are we bound together by a constitution? Now, the idea of infrastructure goes back all the way back, uh, you know, to, to right after the, this nation is founded and, and earns its independence. Um, right after, so the, uh, the Treaty of Paris is, in, is signed in 1783. And in the Treaty of Paris, the United States not only gets its freedom, but it also gets a huge swath of land uh, 
about the, the eastern third of, of North America. And George Washington uh, notes very quickly that settlers are starting to stream into the Ohio Valley. And as we talked last class, but I'll do it, I'll show you again, because it's, it's worth noting. You don't need to see my email here. Let's see here, Google Maps. Um, if we look, at, we look at the United States, there's this, a lot of flat country right along here along the eastern seaboard, but then there's this, this line of mountains, the Allegheny Mountains, that, uh, that uh, kind of separates the eastern part of the United States from the middle, Midwest. And it's these, these mountains here. And what, with, the, with the Treaty of Paris, we, gain, we essentially gain territory all the way out to essentially out to here. We, we gain all of this new territory. Actually, we gain part of uh, Wisconsin and, and we gain Illinois, we gain Wisconsin and, and parts of Minnesota as part of it. But what, what George Washington notes is that settlers are starting to stream past these mountains and starting to settle into Kentucky and into Ohio. And what he's worried about is that in terms of them transporting goods, the most natural place for them to transfer, the way to transport goods is either down the Mississippi River, down here, which is gonna go to the Spanish controlled uh, New, or New Orleans, or out the, um, uh, out, or out, out the, um, the Great Lakes and out through French controlled, um, out through, through French controlled, um, uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway and through French, French controlled Canada. Um, now, if you think about it, where, where does George Washington live? George Washington lives right on the Potomac River. So he lives down here in, in Alexandria, right down here on the Potomac River. And he takes a look at this Potomac River, and he says this Potomac River goes right up into the Ohio Valley. And he, so he says, gosh, that's where we need to develop a waterway. Um, we need to develop a waterway uh, through the Potomac into the, into the, uh, into the Ohio Valley. So, he quickly he sees this he sees that the, that there's this that there is this uh, there's an absence of transportation that makes it difficult for farmers and others to move goods in a, you know out of the Ohio Valley and Kentucky into to the eastern uh, into the eastern seaboard roads are basically rough and unreliable and transportation by rivers are impossible because essentially there's waterfalls and rapids as these rivers as these rivers try to cross the Allegheny you know not cross but as they flow out of the Allegheny Rivers, there's no, there's no uh, uh, good waterway into this, into, this, into this western part of the country. Um, and so what Washington wants to do is build a set of canal locks around the Potomac's five major waterfalls, and that way connecting uh, the U.S., or the eastern part of the U.S. with, with the Ohio Valley. Um, he, since he lives, on the Potomac River, he naturally thinks the Potomac River is the natural way to do it. The problem is, is that under the Articles of Confederation, which governs the United States in the 1780s, this is gonna require a formal treaty between Maryland and Virginia and to get the approval of other states. So what Washington does is he convenes a meeting at his house. So his home is, his name is Mount Vernon, it's in Virginia. And he convenes a meeting of Maryland and Virginia legislators in 1785, and they realized that they, to try to uh, basically clear out some of these waterfalls and to build canal locks through these waterfalls on the Potomac River to try to get passage uh, up into the uh, um, up into the Ohio Valley, they quickly become frustrated in this meeting uh, in Maryland and Virginia that they're sort of unable to accomplish this. So they convene, they call, out of this meeting comes a call for a, for a convention in Annapolis in 1786 in which the leaders of the 13 states are invited to try to 
revised the Articles of Confederation to improve interstate commerce and to allow for, for improvements, internal improvements that are going to cross state lines and to think about how to fund them in a way in a, to be jointly funded. Um, the, Indian, the Annapolis Convention in Annapolis, Maryland, ultimately doesn't, doesn't resolve anything, but it, also, it ultimately leads to a call for a constitutional convention, what becomes the constitutional convention in Philadelphia in 1787. So if you think about where the new constitution came from, it partly is driven uh, by internal improvements. And I'll just note here, and we'll come back to this, that James Madison, in his Federalist Papers, so the Federalist Papers were a set of documents written by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and, and Jay, John Jay, uh, defending the Constitution uh, and arguing for its ratification. And James Madison, in his Federalist Paper, number 45, 14, I'm sorry, Federalist Paper 14, defends the new Constitution as forming a government that would unite the country through roads and canals and advocates for that, says that's a way, we'll, we need a strong government, strong central government, so that we can build these roads and canals. Now, also going on uh, at the same time in the 1780s, it's not just George Washington who's thinking about a vision for the country, and, and uh, well, well, Washington's uh, vision is a little more nuts and bolts and a little more uh, economic and grounded, Thomas Jefferson, as is, as is Thomas Jefferson's way, is a little more uh, uh, sort of pie in the sky. I don't want to say pie in the sky, but, but uh, he's got a he's got a sort of a grander vision. He's got a he's got a particular vision uh, for the country. Um, what he sees, what he what Jefferson wants to do is he sees this this new nation and he wants to create a democratic, egalitarian and emphasis on an agrarian society. He wants a society of small family farmers that he thinks will be the economic underpinning of a political democracy. The problem is to how to, there's all this Western land and what he wants to avoid is he doesn't want this Western land to all fall in the hands of just a small few who could then control it. He wants to make sure that the, all of this, this Western land gets divided up and so that we become a, a nation of, of landholders where everybody holds a small piece of land rather than having large, having just a, a small number of very large landholders. Slightly ironic because he's a large landholder himself, but he has this vision that we're going to be a nation of small farmers and wants to uh, create a framework for setting this up. And so what he has in mind is creating vast land surveys that are going to map the entire Western territory, and he's going to have this sort of square mile continental grid orient, oriented structure. Things are going to be on uh, very much north south and cut up into squares. Um, and he, he has this idea of doing this. So let me. So his idea is that land's going to get grouped into townships that are going to be six miles by six miles, which he thinks is the largest that any sort of political unit can hold together. He thinks basically any political unit more than six by six uh, isn't going to be able to hold together uh, given, given trouble, with, given challenges with communication and travel. So these 36 square mile sections will make up a township that'll get sold either in complete sections, which would be 640 acres, half sections, or quarter sections. And a quarter section, he comes with 160 acres, thinks that's the smallest, because he thinks that's sort of the smallest unit that could support a family farm. Um, and so he has in mind, there's a, sort of one of the first examples of this is going to be what's called the Seven Ranges in Southeast Ohio. So here's a map of the Seven Regions, uh, Seven Ranges. And you can see, let me blow this up a little bit. We sort of blow this up. You can see that what he's going to do is cut up each um, each unit into 36 squares. Uh, there's going to be a common area, so this central area will be common. Uh, section 16 will be devoted toward to public education. It'll be sort of uh, 
uh, be interesting. And, and so this is a map where they carve things up and then, but you can see that it's all on a, it's all on a grid, irregardless of, of sort of many uh, other sort of uh, geographic features. Let me go back to fit page and do a view. Full screen. Um, George, could I ask a question? Sure. Could I ask, is, um, is there some theory behind why he thinks, you know, six by six miles exactly is the, the right size? And, you know, this is quite specific. Does he have a reason for these particular numbers? Uh, I don't, I don't, he does, the reason I'm, I understand is that basically he thinks that's, uh, I, don't, I don't know of a, why, why, how he actually comes up with a number of six by six, but he says that's the largest, in terms of political units, he wants to see sort of small towns. Yeah. And he thinks basically a small town. He wants to see very. He wants to. He wants. He wants political. He wants political power to be local. And he thinks that uh, that sort of the largest sort of political unit that can really hold together is going to be six by six by six. But I. I that's a good question. I, I don't know where that okay. that comes from. Sure. Um, it is easy to divide, divide by 36. That's true. Uh, which, which could be, that could be a, um, yeah, six is divisible by, uh, by many numbers. That may be, that may be one of the reasons, but I, I'll look into that. I don't know. Um, now, the, uh, the continental government, Often gets this view that that uh, there's this view the continental the continental government for the Confederate uh, and under the Articles of Confederation that very little gets accomplished in the 1780s. But one place where they do make substantial progress is in thinking about how to allocate Western lands, um, and in terms of developing a mechanism for 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 developing and selling off Western lands. And it comes in three main pieces of legislation. One is the Land Ordinance of 1784, the Land Ordinance of 1785, and then the Northwest, Terri Northwest Ordinance. Uh, much of the credit here goes to Jefferson on this. So the seven, Land Ordinance of 1784, uh, it's largely a statement of principles rather than mechanics. Um, but it, 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 it states the principle that Western lands are going to be divided up into new states that equal, equal uh, in both political rights and obligations to existing states. And so it sets, it sets the, it sets the uh, precedent, or maybe not the precedent, but it, it sets the principle down that the existing states aren't just going to grow and take over. We're not going to end up with you know, a country made up of just 13 states that are extremely uh, long and uh, you know, expand all across the country, that we're going to create new states, we'll admit new states, and these new states are, are going to be, have, are going to be equal standing uh, to existing states. In the Land Ordinance of 1785, they put a little more uh, meat uh, to this, to these principles, and uh, put more structure on this, and they divide, they start dividing land up into grids, and in particular, this is where they set the, they set the idea that that section 16 of any grid will be devoted toward public education. Um, and uh, that's also a sort of a principle that these US, the US has built on that public education should be uh, you know, dispersed uh, and available for everyone. And, and maybe that's also partly the, the six miles of who can, you know, how can you get to a school uh, with the idea that you know, nobody should travel, probably have, nobody should travel more than three miles to get to a school. That may be a bit speculation here. The Northwest Ordinance uh, gets passed in 1787. It's, it's an interesting thing then that it actually gets passed in 1787, but it gets signed in 1789. Under, gets passed by the Continental Congress, but gets signed by President Washington under the new Constitution, which is uh, uh, sort of an interesting political. Thing. And it creates the Northwest Territory. What's the Northwest Territory? The Northwest Territory is Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, and part of, part of Minnesota. 
and it it also establishes uh, under the new new government that existing states are not just going to expand westward, that they'd ceded all the unsettled land to the federal government. The federal government owned this new land, and we would get the admission of new states. There. As we talked about last class, there was the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, which has to do with, again, so just to get you to get things clear, uh, the Northwest Ordinance establishes this territory. Uh, that happens in 1789, establishes and, and starts to create a, create a process for dividing up this land and starting to sell it uh, to, to private landholders. Uh, the Louisiana Purchase, which is this area here, um, gets purchased in, in, from the French in, in 1803. And we'll need to talk about dividing that up as well. But that's going to be a topic for another day and perhaps another course. Um, we'll talk there. Now, let me just note on the Constitution uh, that section, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution says that Congress uh, has the power to collect taxes for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But nowhere in the Constitution are, are internal improvements ever mentioned. And so it's this question about what does general welfare mean? Uh, it has to uh, do with sort of implied powers, that powers uh, that are not given elsewhere are implied to be part of uh, Congress's powers. And so now Congress does have the power to, to regulate interstate commerce. So then the question is going to become what internal, if it, the argument's going to be that does the, well, the question is, does the federal government have the power under the Constitution to finance internal improvements? Um, it has the power to regulate interstate commerce. So if an internal improvement regulates is part of in, interstate commerce, you know, you could do it under the interstate commerce clause. But how about an, an internal improvement that, that resides solely within a state? Does the federal government have the power to do that? That's what's going to, is going to be debated here. It's going to be given. Now the historian John Larson has kind of, he's sort of the, uh, he's a professor at Indiana and is sort of the, uh, main researcher on on internal improvements uh, just reports sort of five chan he could have cites five cha challenges for getting internal for getting support for internal improvements at the state level and it's important to kind of think about this that one is sort of national natural advantages are not evenly distributed against states so suppose you want to create a road or a canal that crosses uh, through these Allegheny Mountains it might make more sense just geographically uh, to do it through one state or another. And then the benefits are going to flow, you know, across different states. Secondly, political geography and, and nature sort of seldom work in con concert. That rivers flow where they flow, and it doesn't. They often flow across state lines. Um, further, these projects are going to be very large. And in terms of thinking about risk sharing, the federal government's going to be in a much better uh, uh, position. To um, it's going to be in a much better position to sort of absorb these risks and to, and to allocate these risks, you know, in terms of these financing, these large risky projects, rather than doing it at the local or state level. And then further, there's just a lot of uncertainty. Whenever you investing in a new technology, the question will be, you know, is there, are you investing in, in a technology that will quickly be leapfrogged? Uh, and uh, now there's also this fifth one, which is sort of Americans. Some Americans view development as exploitive, corrupt, and unrepublican, but that's a topic for another class. Um, now, Albert Gallatin, so when Thomas Jefferson was president in the early 1800s, uh, he was very, you know, he, Thomas Jefferson was interested in creating this brand new society. And as part of creating this brand new society, he wanted a plan, uh, you know, a national plan for how to, how to create this new society and realize that uh, in order to do it, it needed, needed a national sort of transportation plan. And so he gave the task to Albert Gallatin. And Albert Gallatin uh, creates this report, which is a, a, re a remarkable report. I, uh, again, a copy of this is, on, is available on the web and I'll, I'll forward one at the end of this lecture. I'll forward a link to it. Um, so he, Gallatin asked the Senate for 
basically he goes to the Senate and says, or goes to the U.S. Congress and says, Congress, tell me to write this report. Congress tells him to write the report and he goes and does it. And he has two policy goals. One is to sort of merge the, the goal of Thomas Jefferson's, uh, that we create these vast lands controlled by the national government um, beyond the border of the original 13 states are going to get sold in a way that would foster a nation of, of independent farmers. That's going to get divided up into small grids. And then secondly, George Washington's goal that the newly settled lands of the American interior get linked to national and in, international markets through Atlantic ports on the East Coast. They want to tie the West to the East as well. And so Gallatin sort of uh, seeks to reconcile these two visions. And so he creates a system of roads and canals um, to, to open up transportation. He has the idea that, that we're going to be able to sell off these Western lands in order to foster new infrastructure. And that the idea is that this plan is going to ultimately foster an egalitarian society. I, I take a look. So there's basically two components. There's basically a set of roads and map, basically roads and canals. Uh, some are going to flow north-south and some are going to flow east-west. Let me show you a map of Gallatin's plan. And I think this is pretty remarkable. If you think about it, this is his map. And he basically says, we're going to create a, we're going to create a road from Georgia to Maine. And if you look at that, that's essentially Interstate 95. It's, it, Interstate 95 basically lines up with what he said. He also wants to create what's called the United States Turnpike. That's basically I-70 nowadays. And he has an idea of a canal going through New York. That's going to become, that's going to essentially become the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal is actually going to go like that. But he, he, his plan sort of foresees, you, when you take a look at the United States and you take a look at our transportation system, you realize where did 95 come from? It came from Gallatin. It's kind of quite, I find quite remarkable. Um, now, Gallatin's going to propose a private-public partnership with the federal government, advancing loans or purchasing stock in, in private companies. Um, and so he's going to use the idea, of, he wants to use private markets, but, but he says federal funds are going to supplement sort of inadequate private funds. Um, unfortunately, this Gallatin's plan never gets carried through explicitly because the War of 1812 arrives, and that drains the federal surplus that Gallatin had intended to allocate for infrastructure. And then after the War of 1812, we're going to see sort of this great divide between free and slave states are going to make any sort of truly national plan uh, impossible. And we're really not going to get a national plan until the southern states uh, secede in 1860. The War of 1812 ends, and in December of 1815, Madison asks for a number of things. He says, let's get a new, new bank, a new national bank, a protective tariff. He wants some investments in military investments. He wants some investments in coastal defenses. And he wants construction of roads and canals. It's all pretty remarkable when you think of Madison's transformation. He's pushing for a national bank, and now he's also pushing for military investments. Congress passes the new bank and the protective tariff, but he doesn't, they, don't pass the, they don't pass anything else. Um, let me, well, okay, let me, let me talk about the American American system. So Henry Clay of Kentucky comes up with this idea of the American system. Uh, he's a, uh, he serves uh, in both the House and the Senate, eventually. And what happens is that there's a surge of, of revenue. And so the War of 1812 ends, and along with the War of 1812, the end of the War of 1812, the war in Europe also is ending. And international trade surges. Uh, and in particular, there's a surge of imports into the United States in the War of 1812. Uh, revenue surges, and they, and we, we rewrite the tariffs uh, in 1816. And these new tariffs are, are designed primarily for protection, but not for revenue. But in the process, they actually generate quite a bit of revenue and bring quite a bit of revenue into the federal government. Now, the question is, what's to do with the revenue? And here's the Here's the basic, the basic thing to keep in mind, is that if you're a U.S. Man, if you're a manufacturer in the United States, you want high taxes. Okay, that sounds a bit unintuitive today. We think of businesses wanting low taxes, but here 
what the taxes are tariffs and they're the ones providing protection to your industry. So you want, you want high taxes. Now, if you want high taxes, you need to also come up with ways to spend that money so that there's a justification for that high revenue, for that high amount of revenue and those high taxations and that high taxation protects you. So there's a, a large constituency for, for more government spending and it's coming from the business sector, from manufacturing. And so Clay develops this policy, which becomes known as the American system. And it has three parts. First of all, we want to create a strong banking system that's going to provide abundant and widespread credit. Two, it's going to have protective tariffs to benefit Eastern manufacturing. And then the revenue from these protective, tar protective tariffs, so the Eastern, Eastern states get their tariffs and that protects them. And then the revenue from that is going to be spent largely in the West, creating roads and canals that are going to benefit out of the West. The South, it's sort of interesting, the South doesn't really benefit from this system. Um, and it's named the American system to try to contrast it with the British system of Adam Smith. And this. Now, as part of this, they want to they want to create more they want to create more spending. And part of it is the the War of 1812 ends, and they want to uh, start funding some of these internal improvements. So, in 1817, as part of this American plan, they resurrect the Gallatin plan. And Senator Calhoun of South Carolina introduces a bill in 1817 that says that the bonus that ought to come, so the treasury is owed $1.5 million in a dividend uh, from revenue from the new, the new bank of the United States. The second bank of the United States is supposed to pay a bonus to the treasury of 1.5 million. And Calhoun wants to take that 1.5 million and spend it on internal improvements, okay? Now, in the legislation, the money is, is only set aside for later appropriations. And he's, he's, he basically doesn't want to tie his hands on what exactly is going to be, be uh, funded. And so he leaves sort of an open-ended financing mechanism. He kind of just, he doesn't, he's not specific about any projects. He says, we're just going to spend this on, on internal improvements to be named later. And due to a but, you know, it's, it's legislation, and so due to a variety of compromises, each state's going to benefit in proportion to the population, and it's going to get to approve all federal activities within its borders. So it's kind of, it's a messy piece of legislation, and it's not specific. James Madison, on his last day as president, vetoes this bill, and he argues it's unconstitutional. And this comes as a big surprise to everybody. So first of all, you know, we recall that Madison's authorship of Federalist Number 14 argues that the, one of the virtues of this Constitution uh, is that we'll be able to fund internal improvements and in, and in public works projects, what they call internal improvements, roads and canals. He was also the Secretary of the State at the time of the Louisiana Purchase, and he was part of the Secretary of State when, when the Gallatin Plan was constructed, was put together and established. So he was kind of you know, to, to them to argue that it's unconstitutional uh, for the federal government to finance internal improvements was, was very much a shock. Um, but it's hard when James Madison tells you something's unconstitutional, it's, uh, it's hard to challenge him, given that he's uh, uh, one, of the, one of the key drafters of the Constitution. So what it does, it moves financing of internal improvements back to the states and really thrusts it onto them. So what happens? Well, when, with, with internal improvements going back to the states, New York's the first one, first state to move. And it, it uh, funds and builds the most famous of all internal improvements uh, and famous for good reasons, the Erie Canal. Uh, it's, it dramatically changes the United States of America. So the, little, the history here is that the governor of, uh, of New York, Governor DeWitt Clinton, sees the possibility of a canal more ambitious than anyone proposed by Gallatin. Gallatin proposes a canal in New York, but Clinton says we can do more than that. And in 1811, they actually following up on Gallatin's plan, uh, Clinton and Governor Morris, uh, that governor's his first name, go to Washington to try to ask for federal money uh, to fund uh, the, what would become the Erie Canal. Um, and uh, that ends up dying with the War of 1812 getting uh, under undertaken. And so, um, and because of it, it just note that 
he wanted, they want to create a waterway from the Hudson River to Lake Erie around Buffalo. And without it, Great Lake traffic is all going to go north uh, toward Montreal and the St. Louis uh, and, and the St. Louis Seaway. And Mississippi tra Valley travel is going to go is going to Mississippi Valley is going to goods are going to go down the Mississippi River to the south through through St. Louis and New Orleans. So the Erie Canal gets first gets proposed in 1808 right up with the Gallatin plan. It gets constructed in 1817 to 1825 and it opens in 1825. Um, hold on one second. Um, what's interesting is that it, that are just sort of interesting, a little political history that's sort of interesting, is that it's actually originally opposed by New York City politicians. Just keep that in mind, that New York City politicians actually vote against it. But it's, it's uh, quite remarkable when you think about the impact of it. Let me, let me so one, is, let me just show you a map of it. Hold on. Let me show you a map. So the Erie Canal, it starts just north of Albany, and it's a canal that goes through here, just north of Syracuse. And what's interesting is they didn't, you could, this little spur here didn't get built until later. They, they raced what they didn't want. Uh, they were worried that once you got to Lake Erie, ships might as well just go out the St. Louis uh, a Seaway. So they first built it all the way here and built it south of Buffalo to just, just or not south, just west of Buffalo. It cuts here. And then they created this spur later once it was created. Now what this is gonna do is to really appreciate the, the Erie Canal, you gotta look at a map of the United States. Um, and this is a little bit, this is more sort of economic history than, than uh, uh, fiscal history, but, it, but it's worth, it's really worth showing. So take, take a look at the United States and the Erie Canal creates a waterway that goes here. It creates an artificial river that goes down the, and then the Hudson goes here and you've got it. It creates a waterway like this. By doing so, what it does is it ties New York to Detroit to Chicago. It ties these three cities together closely. And what it means, and it, it means is that basically goods and services, basically agricultural goods, if, you can, if you're producing a good out here or out here, all you have to do is get it to Chicago. And once you get this to Chicago or to Detroit, you can put it on a ship and take it out and take it out you know to the sea uh, very quickly I mean very, really, relatively cheaply water transportation is still to this day the cheapest way to ship goods and service to ship goods is, is by water it's cheaper than railroads it's cheaper than trucks it's cheaper than uh, than trains uh, and, and definitely cheaper than planes and what it makes is it means that it means that cities like Chicago and cities like Detroit become coastal cities. They're in effect coastal cities. They now have a clear, uh, have clear sort of passage uh, in, in to, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean that goes th solely through the United States. And it kind of, it, it sort of, in, in, a, in a real sense, it sort of rotates. The United States kind of thought itself sort of north-south, and it's going to kind of rotate the U.S. much more sort of along, a, along an east-west uh, axis. It's going to make this transportation route much, much uh, 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 more important. And it's going to, it's going to really uh, give a high dose, you know, really jumpstart the economies of Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, and those cities. The other thing it's going to do um, is it's going to, is it used to be that, or prior to the Erie Canal, Philadelphia was the, was the financial hub 
of uh, the United States. It was really the financial center. And now with all of these goods and services, all of these goods and services that are coming from the Midwest, basically all goods and services coming out of Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, all of those goods are now going to flow right next to New York's, right by New York City. And it's going to move the financial center of the United States from Philadelphia to New York and make New York City the dominant city of, uh, of the United States. It's really, that's what is really going to create that. Um, and and the New York's going to really, uh, it is going to be one of the big winners of, of the Erie Canal. Um, whoops. We do that. And so it's kind of ironic that the, it, you know, the New York City legislatures didn't recognize that. Now what happens is that then, of course, other states take a look at this. And because it's not part of a national plan, it, it's every state is, is out for themselves, is on their own. The benefits of the Erie Canal flow solely to New York State. They don't, uh, they don't flow to any other state as well. They don't flow to any other state because it's not a federal project. And, and so the revenue from the Erie Canal doesn't flow to the federal government, it flows only to the state government, to states. And so Pennsylvania sees this and they see that they see, uh, you know, their economic power sort of floating to the north. And so they, they decide that they need to create a set of canals. So they appoint a board of canal commissioners in 1825 and they begin trying to construct a set of canals between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. However, it's a much greater engineering challenge than the Erie Canal. Again, geographical advantages are not evenly spread across states. And in, in sort of the political uh, horse trading that occurs in order to fund this, you end up with, with canals to nowhere and all these sort of branch lines. And so the Erie Canal, or I mean, sorry, not the Erie Canal, the Pencil these Pennsylvania canals, they, they end up not earning any revenue until 1834. They never earn enough revenue to cover any interest payments on the debt that they borrow to create, to create these, uh, to build these, these canals. And quickly by 1846, you have the private Pennsylvania Railroad that comes in and is going to make the, these canals obsolete. Um, and here's a map of, it's hard to get a map of these Pennsylvania canals because they basically were all uh, basically basic failures. All of these canals are now, well, uh, now actually beautiful bike trails there. Um, George Washington did eventually get his, uh, his dream of a canal uh, along the Potomac River, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, uh, which starts in Georgetown uh, there in Washington, D.C., and goes up through Ohio. Again, it's now a beautiful bike trail uh, you can do in a, in a beautiful national park. Um, so Pennsylvania, Maryland, with the help of Virginia and Pennsylvania, and they get some help through the federal government. I'm not quite sure how. That's, I got asked that, and I got to look that up. But that does eventually, that gets built as well the Chesapeake and Ohio, right there along, the, that goes right along the Potomac River, um, uh, starting, in, starting in Washington, D.C., in Georgetown, the Georgetown part of Washington, D.C. And again, it's a, it's a beautiful bike trail there. Um, the idea of, of sort of, of internal improvements at the federal level gets kicked around in the 1820s. It gets, there's a lot of proposals. There's actually an interesting proposal by John Quincy Adams to propose a national university in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's interesting, you know, the United States does not have a national university. All this, the uh, public universities are all at the state level. Um, but, in, but instead of a grand plan, what happens is a bunch of, it, it, when, it, when it, he draws up this grand plan, but what only what gets proposed are a bunch of small disconnected pork barrel projects. Nothing much ever really comes out of this plan. Um, Andrew Jackson, when he becomes president in the 1830s, he uh, very much opposes Clay's American system. Uh, and um, he's sort of famous for, for um, uh, vetoing this Maysville Road project um, in terms of internal improvements. He, he vetoes a bill that would have authorized federal funding for a project of construction linking Lexington and the Ohio River, where the entirety of the project would be within the state of Kentucky. 
And Jackson says that since a project is, is solely within a single state, it doesn't in, constitute in, interstate commerce. And the, so therefore it's not part of, the, therefore the federal government should not fund it. Uh, he, he's opposed to any funding any project that doesn't cross the state line or doesn't go cut across uh, states. Um, it's interesting though, so he's often labeled as someone who's opposed to national projects. But if you look, actually expenditures uh, surge actually under the Jackson administration. If you look, this is uh, thinking about total federal expenditures for internal improvements as a share of GDP. You'll see it's a tiny fraction of GDP. We're talking one tenth of one percent, and he could he moves it to two you know two tenths of one percent. So we're still talking very small numbers, but you'll see uh, very small numbers. There's a there's a burst uh, here right at, at the end. Um, at the end of War of 1812, there's a burst here in Adam, Adams and J during the Jackson administration. There's going to be a collapse. There's going to, we're going to talk about a, 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 a deep America's first depression and a deep fiscal crisis that's going to occur in the early 1840s. There'll be a surge a uh, little bit again during the, uh, during the Civil War in terms of building lighthouses. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, some railroads getting built. I'm sorry, the 18, I'm sorry, the Civil War is here. The Civil War is here. Uh, I, correct, sorry. That's incorrect with the, when I circled this lighthouses there. This, there's a collapse here in the, during, the, uh, during the Civil War. Uh, though we're gonna see the funding of an interstate, uh, interstate railroad system during the Civil War. Um, again, just th actually thinking about the Civil War, let me, let me talk about that, just fast forward to that. Um, so, uh, during the, one of the things that happens during the U.S. Civil War in the 1860s is the Southern states secede from the Union. And so they, they are no longer part of the Union and they, they, don't, uh, they no longer participate in, in the Senate or in the House, and so they're no longer part of Congress. Um, because of that, um, this breaks a deadlock in terms of what, of, of, in terms of what the role of the federal government is, and it, it shifts power to people who are advocating a much, much more uh, uh, sort of an expansive view of, of federal power, and um, in terms of sort of federal enthusiasm for. For uh, for internal improvements, and we're going to get a return to the to the American system. We'll get a large tariff in 1861, and it, with strong support of Abraham Lincoln, Congress is going to pass in 1862 the Homestead Act, which is going to award 160 free acres. Notice that's the same number as Jefferson. 160 acres. Again, it's going to be on the six by six miles by six miles grids. There's 160 free acres of federal land to any family that could claim and own it. They're going to give away a tremendous amount of Western land here. Um, it's, it's actually, it's worth noting when we talk about wealth in the United States that, you know, if you were here and present in the 1860s, if your family was here, uh, there was an awful lot of land given away to certain populations. Some, some populations in the United States were allowed to participate in these giveaways and other populations were not allowed. And I think that it's important to keep that in mind in there. The other thing that's going to happen in the 1860s is they're going to pass the Pacific Railroad Act, which is going to authorize the first transcontinental railroad, uh, which will be completed after uh, the Civil War. But that's going to be, again, with this idea about binding the nation together through transportation projects. Uh, the same basic idea that sort of high tariffs, public works, and strong banking will uh, also take place in the 1930s. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in some later lectures. Um, it's 7.10, and this is probably a good time to take a break. And so we'll reconvene in 10 minutes uh, at 7.20, unless there's any other, unless there's any questions. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll see you in, in 10 minutes. Bye-bye.